Hey everyone, welcome back to CSC348. Uh, in this video we are talking about recursive definitions, which, yes, they are in fact very similar to the recursion that you would have seen in classes like 202. So, a recursive definition, basically it takes the form of some sort of basis step, which is something, at least one initial value, if not more, and a recursive step, which is at least one rule, if not more than one rule, for uh, finding new values from existing ones. So we're going to talk about how we can apply recursive, de uh, recursive definitions to the existing uh, discrete structures that we already have. So we're going to look at sets, functions, and sequences in this video today. Um, so yeah, really, this is a, I, want, I want to point out specifically the word definition here. This is a way to define it, this is a way to define discrete structures. So a recursive definition for a set is just a way to define a set. It's an alternate way of using things like set builder notation or a written description of a uh, or a written description of what elements are in the set. And similar thing for functions and sequences. So that's the plan for this video. Okay, so the first type of recursive definition that we're going to talk about is recursive sets. So when we're talking about recursively defining sets, what I really want to um, just what I really want to emphasize here is that we're not so much constructing the set as we are discovering items that are in the set or defining like how the rules that uh, items follow in order to be in that set. So if you think about it like that, um, it kind of works a little bit easy. It, it kind of helps. Uh, it kind of helps make it easier to figure out the you know recursive definitions for some sets. So for a recursive set, the basis step is basically just going to outline some initial value or multiple values in the set. And the recursive step is going to basically take all of the elements that you've discovered so far, and then it will define rules on adding more elements in there. So the uh, we can do an example. I'd say that the sort of ultimate recursive set is the natural numbers. So if we want to recursively define the, uh, yeah, recursively define the natural numbers like this, um, we can actually look, we can look towards the piano axioms to actually give us a rule. So recall that the first piano axiom says that zero is a natural number. So that actually gives us our basis step. So basis step. We can actually pretty much write it out exactly like how it shows up in the piano axiom. So this is how this is how you want to do this for defining a recursive step. For the basis step, you give an element that is in the set. So zero is a natural number. Then for the recursive step, what you do is you say hey, let's take some arbitrary value or arbitrary values in there and do some sort of operation in order to make a new value that we know is in the set. So according to the piano axiom, if n is a natural number, this is us taking some arbitrary previously discovered value of the natural numbers, then n plus 1 is a natural number. So this is going to be basically how we take that previously defined value and modify it to get a, a new value to the set. So when you're doing a basis step, it's always going to be of the form some element is in the natural number, or is in the set that you're trying to define, or some elements are in the set that you're trying to define. When you're defining the recursive step, it's always each rule that defines the recursive step is will be in a uh, if then statement or will be a conditional. So for full credit, when you're recursively defining a set, you have to follow those two rules. Basis step, list of elements that are in the set in terms of this propositional form right here. So like zero is a natural number. Recursive step, always if then statements, always conditional statements. And that will help us determine like, okay, based on, based on all the values that we have, what are the new values we can discover? So if we want to look at how these rules work in the natural numbers, what I'd like to do is I like to sort of make a table. So 
basis step here with basically what I'm doing on this side, I'm describing the uh, number of applications of the recursive step here. And on this side, I'm, de I'm basically describing the set of all items that we have discovered in the natural numbers so far. So in this case, we have zero so far, because all we know in the base system is that zero is a natural number. Then when we do our first application of the recursive step, we're saying, okay, if n is a natural number, then n plus one is a natural number. So we take every element that we've discovered up here so far and then see, and then put basically that element plus one in the natural number. So this gives us zero and one. Then let's, re let's apply it again. So for the second application, we're going to do the same thing. So we're going to first look at this zero up here. So zero plus one is one. So we know that one is a natural number. That's redundant, so we don't need to put that in. Actually, what we can do is we can put in all the uh, values from here immediately into here. And then, we, and then we start doing the rules. So basically for all n, for all n in the natural numbers, you can add n plus one to the set. So zero is a natural number, so we can add one to the set. One is already there, so we don't need to bother. One is a natural number, so we can add two to the set, like that. And that's our second application of our recursive step. The third application is going to do the exact same thing. So we can write down zero, one, two. Then you know we, we start applying this rule to every element that we have in as of the second application in the basis step. So zero plus one, we add in, already there. One plus one, we add in, already there. Two plus one, we, we add in, and we don't have that one yet, so we put in three, and so on. So I might ask you some questions on homework or the midterm being like, hey, give me three applications of the recursive step. And this is the kind of thing that you'll want to do. Uh, so let's take a look at a, another possible example. Okay, so for this example, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to define a set S, and then we're going to see what elements are in S and see if we can't find a, uh, a, a nice fancy name for S, or you know, see if that's like any set that we could see or have possibly seen before. So the basis, uh, two, we know that the, the first element that we basically see as being in S is two. So we know that two is in S. And then for a recursive step, if we take any X in S and any Y in S, then we're saying that x plus y is also in s. So let's take a look at what's in here. So at the basis step, we basically just have the set containing two. For the first application, the recursive step, we're going to choose some x in s and some y in s. Well, x and y can only be two. So we would say that we can put two plus two in s, which is four. Uh, so we'll do two and four, like so. For the second round of applying the recursive step, what we can do is we basically have, we can choose x is two, y is two, x is two, y is four, x is four, y is two, and x is four, y is four. Now that's going to give us some redundant information. For x is two, y is two, that uh, x plus y gives us 4, which we already have in here. Let me write down the previous values real quick. For x is 2, y is 4, this says that 6 is in s, so we can put 6 in. For x is 4, y is 2, that gives us that 6 is in s, which we've already, we already have that in there, so we don't need to add anything. And then when x is 4, y is 4, we know that 8 is an element of our set. In the third application, we'll do the same thing. So I'm going to cut down a little bit on explanation and we'll see what new element. I'll, I'll show off what new elements we get in there and why they get in there. So what we can do is we can note that 2 plus 4 and 2 plus 6, we've already seen the results of those. So we can look start looking at 2 plus 8. That'll be 10 gets put in there. Uh, 4 plus 4, we already have 4 plus 6 we already have as well. Four plus eight, we don't have, that would be 12. Six plus six, we have uh, six plus eight, we don't have, that'd be 14. And then eight plus eight, we don't have, 
and that's 16. So <clears throat> basically what we have is every time we have a new recursive step, we're adding in a whole bunch of even numbers. So we can actually generalize this to say that s is equal to, uh, zero is not in here, so it's not quite the even natural numbers. What we could say is all the even positive natural numbers or all the even natural numbers that are greater than zero. All right, so the next type of uh, recursive definition for discrete structure is recursive functions. So we're going to let t and s be non-empty sets with t being a subset of the integers. Uh, we'll basically define f uh, that maps inputs in t to outputs in s. We can define f recursively using a basis step and recursive step where the basis step, we take some, uh, some value t in our input set and define what f of t is explicitly. So saying something like f of t equals k for some specific element in uh, k in s. Then a recursive step, basically what we're doing is we're, we're taking some n in our input set and defining f of n in terms of some already encountered input-output combination. So probably the best way of looking at this is through an example. Right here, what we have is f going from the natural numbers to natural numbers defined by the basis step being f of 0 equals 1, and the recursive step being f of n equals f of n minus 1 times n. So if you take a look at this, uh, we can look at f of 0, which equals 1 by the basis step, f of 1 equals 1, f of 2 equals 2 times 1, which is 2, f of 3 equals 3 times 2, which is 6, and so on. This is basically a recursive way of defining the, the, fib, uh, the uh, factorial function. So we can say that f equals n factorial, or sorry, we can say that f of n equals n factorial. So what I have right here and I'll get into this in a little bit in the video, but what I have here is what's known as a closed form of the definition. So we have basically defined this uh, this function in terms of a non-recursive definition right here, but more on that later. So what you might be able to notice here, and this is somewhat true for a lot of other recursively defined functions, is that it's pretty analogous to writing a recursive algorithm for uh, solving this problem like you might in classes like 202 or 203. So let's check, check out the uh, Python code for this. Uh, if I want to define, uh, let's call it fib this time, or, or not fib, sorry, let's just call it f, where you take in n. Uh, so if we say something like if n is equal to 0, uh, sorry, forgot my Python for a hot sec. If n is equal to zero, then return one. So all of this matches up with the basis step right here. Then in order to handle the recursive step, we could say something like else, uh, that would be f of n, or sorry, that would be return f of n minus one times n. So that all is handled in the recursive step right here. So when you're working on uh, recursive functions, it might be helpful for you to first consider write how you would write out the problem recursively using code and then translate that to a basis step like so. So specifically when we're talking about functions, I want to make this clear. This is for functions, not for sets. Sometimes students get the, get a, uh, things mixed up between recursively defining sets and recursively defining functions, and that's a very good way of losing points. So when you're defining a function, you always do f in terms of some input equals something. For the recursive step, it will be f in terms of some input equals something that has to do with f in terms of another smaller input. So that's recursive functions for you. All right, so in the sequences and sums video, I said that a uh, you know a sequence is basically just a way of taking a function's in, uh, outputs and sort of unrolling them into one long ordered structure. And a recursively defined sequence, or what we call a recurrence relation, is no different. 
basically we're going to recursively define a function. We're going to do the same thing as recursively define a function, but instead of making it explicitly in terms of a function, we're actually going to do that in terms of some sequence notation. So for the basis step, uh, for some initial value or values t, uh, we're just going to define what a sub t is, which is the same thing as defining what f sub t is in reality if we say that f of n is equal to a sub n for uh, all values of n in t. The recursive step is we're going to take some uh, <clears throat> we're going to take some n in t and we're just going to define a sub n in terms of previously defined elements of our sequence. So for example, we can look at um, defining 2 to the n for n equals 0 to infinity. We can use the basis step. And, uh, the basis step being n equals 0 is probably a fantastic place to start. So we can do that with basis step a naught equals 1 and recursive step. a sub n equals 2 times a sub n minus 1. Altogether, we can put this we can put these together and we can say, okay, so our first element is 1. Then if we're trying to, def sorry, our zeroth element is 1. If we're trying to define a sub n, that would be 2 times a sub 0. So that'd be 2. Uh, a sub 2 is 2 times a sub 1. So 4. a sub 3 is 2 times a sub 2. And so on. Uh, so here, uh, the next example that I want to look at is the Fibonacci numbers. <clears throat> I believe I have spelled that wrong. So that's Fibonacci numbers, which I've talked about a little bit, I believe. Um, but basically, they're a really cool set of numbers right here. So this one, actually, we have two base cases. So uh, we'll say... The Fibonacci numbers are basically, we would say f sub n or f sub n, yeah, f sub whatever. But we use f usually for the Fibonacci numbers instead of a. So the basis step, we'll define two base cases here. First is that f of 0 equals 0. The second is that f of 1 equals 1. And then the recursive step. goes something like f of n equals f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2. Now, it's not accidental that I have two basis steps here and that I have two values, uh, two previous values of f in the recursive step. And that's actually really important right here. So you want to make sure that your base, basically that your basis steps can cover all the possible values of f of n minus 1 and f of n minus 2. If we only had, say, f of 0 as our basis step, then we'd run into trouble if we were trying to define f of 1 in terms of f of 0 and f of negative 1. That's not okay, unfortunately. So what that means is, yeah, we have our recursive set of Fibonacci numbers right here. And this will end up being 0 and 1 because we put in their basis steps. Then f of 2 is uh, f of 1 plus f of 0, so that would be 1. And f of 1 plus f of 2 is f of is, uh, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, and so on. And yeah, that is uh, a good couple examples of recursive, uh, recursively defined sequences, or also what we call recurrence relations. So recursive definitions for functions and recursive definitions for sequences, these are all well and good, but they kind of take a long time to calculate. So let's say I want to figure out the millionth Fibonacci number. Well, in order to do that, I'm going to have to figure out Fibonacci, the uh, 999,999 Fibonacci number and the 999,998 Fibonacci number. In order to do those, I then have to do the 999,998th and 999,997th Fibonacci numbers for this one. And the 999,997th and 999,996th Fibonacci numbers for the other. 
and so on and so on. You can imagine how wild that gets. It, uh, it is not pretty. And a much simpler example, if we're trying to figure out the millionth power of two, then we need to figure out the, you know, 999, wait, we have to figure out 999,999 previous powers of two before we can get to one million. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to express recursive definitions, especially recursive functions and sequences in a non-recursive way. So what we call that is a closed form. A closed form of a recurrence is a non-recursive definition of the sequence. So for example, if we're trying to close a sub zero equals one and a sub, uh, the, the sequence defined by a sub zero equals one and a sub n equals two times a sub n minus one, what we want to do is we want to figure out how to define a sub n without using any previous values of a, uh, of uh, our sequence at all. So this is a pretty easy example. I'll give a harder example after this one, but for this easier example, just follow along with the method that I'm doing to in order to close this because once we get to the harder sequences uh it will be a little bit easier for us to close it uh, to uh use this method to close them so what we want to do we're trying to close a recurrence or in other words we're trying to solve the recurrence is another way of putting it so what we will do is we'll start out by writing a sub n a sub n is what we're trying to determine a value for in terms of just, you know, numbers. So a sub n we can say is equal to, we can directly apply the recursive step here. It's equal to two times a sub n minus one. Well, I'm gonna do some scratch work over on the side as well. So if we have a sub n minus one, by the recursive step, we know that that's equal to two times a sub n minus one minus one, which is two, uh, two times a sub n minus two. So we can actually substitute that in here to get us two times two times a sub n minus two, which is then equal to two squared times a sub n minus two. And I'm gonna leave it like this, and hopefully the reason why I'm going to do that will show up, will be uh, clear shortly. So then over on the scratch work, I'll note that a sub n minus two is equal to two times a sub n minus three. I'll apply this here to then give us that this is, uh, sorry, this is equal to two times two squared times a sub n minus three. Uh, this should be the other way around. So it'd be two squared times two times a sub n minus three. Um, so this would be equal to two cubed times a sub n minus three. Now, something that I want to notice is that we can, if we take a look at this, we can kind of see a pattern. So this would be two to the first times a sub n minus one. So we have a one here and a one here. We have a two here and a two here. And we have a three here and a three down there. So now let's say we want to show off what this pattern is. We want, to, we want to check this pattern for really any possible value right here. So let's say our value is i. If we want to look at the term for a sub n minus i, what would that look like? So we could say something like a sub n equals, and going uh, something basically times a sub n minus i. And going off of the similarities here, we see that this is two to the first power matched up with n minus one, two to the second power matched up with n minus two, two to the third power matched up with n minus three. So we can probably safely assume that we're going to match up two to the ith power with n minus i. Now here's the thing, why are we doing this? Well, what we eventually wanna do is we wanna get down to the base case right here. We want to replace all instances of a sub anything with the base case, which just equals one. So if we have zero, which happens to equal n minus n, that means that a sub n minus n happens to equal a sub zero. So just putting in this math here, because what I want to show is that if we substitute in 
i equals n. So I'll do substitute i equals n. This would give us a sub n equals 2 to the nth power times a sub n minus n, which is then 2 to the nth power times a sub 0. And by the base case up here, we can say that this is equal to 2 to the nth power times 1, so 2 to the n. So what we've done right here is we've shown that we can close the sequence defined by these two rules by saying that a sub n equals 2 to the nth power. Now that's all well and good. Uh, it's a relatively simple example of those, so let's take a look at a more complicated one. Let's say we're trying to solve the uh, recurrence relation given by a sub 0 equals 5 and a sub n equals n plus a sub n minus 1. This one's a little bit tricky, so I'll try to go slowly again and try to show the scratch work to show off what my reasoning is. So be sure to pay attention, um, pause as much as you need, and if you're stuck anywhere along this process, please uh, ask me questions as soon as possible. All right, so we start out, when we want to close a uh, recurrence, I'll say it again, that we, when we want to close that recurrence, we want to put a sub n in terms of some expression that doesn't have another a term in it. So our goal is to set a sub n equal to something. So we always write out what a sub n is. You know, a sub n equals, and we can apply the recursive step immediately right here. n plus a sub n minus 1. And then we want to start doing the same thing where we, where we find a substitution for a sub n minus 1 and then plug it in and so on. So let's do some scratch work over here. We'll note that a sub n minus 1 is equal to... Now, this one's a little bit tricky, so be wary of this. If a sub n is equal to n plus a sub n minus 1, you can think of this as now we're, we're sort of quote unquote substituting in n minus 1 for n. Not, you know, not really, but it, it, you can think of it as sort of working like that. So a sub n minus 1 is actually going to equal n minus 1 plus a sub n minus 2. And a sub n minus 2 is going to equal n minus 2 plus a sub n minus 3. a sub n minus 3 will equal n minus 3 plus a sub n minus 4, and so on and so on. So what we want to do here is, uh, words, we want to start substituting in for a sub n minus 1. So let's do that here. This will be equal to n plus n minus 1 plus a sub n minus 2. And then substituting in here. This will be n plus n minus 1 plus n minus 2 plus a sub n minus 3. Plugging in here, that is n plus n minus 1 plus n minus 2 plus n minus 3 plus a sub n minus 4, and so on. So now at this point, we can try to maybe look for a pattern right here, and I do actually see one. Um, what we have here is we are uh, adding up all the all of the integers. So starting at n and going down by one. So we'll do in this case it's we're just adding up n and we're stopping at the subscript of this term here. So we just do n here. For this one we do n and n minus one and we stop at the subscript here. This would be n plus n minus one plus n minus two, stopping at n minus three n plus n minus 1 plus n minus 2 plus n minus 3, stopping at the subscript n minus 4. So my hypothesis is that if we have a sub n minus i, so let's say equals n plus n minus 1 plus n minus 2 plus all the way through to n minus i plus 1 plus a sub n minus i. This is what I'm thinking the pattern is looking like. 
And if you plug in different values of i for 1, 2, 3, and 4, you should see that this actually works out pretty well. And then we can rephrase this as sort of being equal to the sum from j equals, let's see, uh, i minus 1 to, z or sorry, the sum from j equals, what would it be? Let's say n minus i plus 1 to n of j. All of that plus a sub n minus i, like so. So this is basically just expressing, this sum expresses all of these terms, and then plus a sub n minus i. Now we're going to do the thing where we substitute in 0 for i. So we'll let i equal 0. Oh, sorry, i equal n. Because what we, we eventually want to get down here is that we want to get this to a sub 0. So when i equals n, we can say that a sub n equals the sum from j equals n of minus n plus 1 to n plus, uh, sorry, of j plus a sub n minus n. Now we can do some simplification here. This is equal to the sum from j equals n minus n plus 1 is just going to be 1 to n of j plus a sub 0. Now this value right here, you all should be familiar with this because in the sequences and sums video, I told you that this is one of the ones that you need to memorize. So this happens to be equal to n times n plus 1 divided by 2. And then a sub 0 equals uh, is 5. So we can say that this whole thing is plus 5. And that's our closed form solution for a sub n. a sub n equals n times n plus 1 divided by 2 plus 5. All right. And then the last thing I want to do is uh, I want to very quickly talk about the Fibonacci sequence because uh, I'll say it as many times as, you know, as it comes to me to say it. I really love the Fibonacci sequence. So this one is a really tricky one to close. And I'm not going to ask you to remember this. I will ask you to remember what the Fibonacci sequence is because it's a really important sequence and we actually have plenty of proofs that have to do with it. But I'm not going to ask you what the closed form is. And the reason why that is, is because the closed form of the Fibonacci numbers is equal to 1 plus the square root of 5 to the nth power minus 1 minus the square root of 5 to the nth power, all over 2 to the n root 5. The proof for this is nasty. It took uh, an hour of a grad student lecture to prove that this statement is true. Uh, it is ugly. It is a lot of fun if you're a uh, mathicist, as some people refer to us. Um, it's a lot of fun if you like uh, working with Taylor series until you feel like you want to, um, I don't know, pick a fight with Taylor himself. But uh, it's, a, it's a very long proof. It's not something I'll... Uh, this isn't something I want you to remember, more like a Hey, isn't it super cool that we have all of these irrational terms right here on the top and the bottom and that they somehow equal exactly an integer every single time for every possible value of n? It's amazing. Anyway, so this has been the video on recursive definitions. I hope you all have a wonderful day.